Hello, everybody, and welcome to episode two of AI Inside, our new podcast on all things artificial intelligence uh, in, in this world. Over time, we will talk about everything. We will leave no stone unturned. I think it's going to take us a while to get there. Um, who is us? It's me, Jason Howell, joined, as always, by my friend Jeff Jarvis. Good to see you, Jeff. Hey, boss. How are you? Good to see you. I'm I'm doing well. It's great to see you too. Um, I'm really happy. Like you know, episode one went off without a hitch. We've received a ton of really great feedback. Yep. Um, well, thank you all out there. Yeah. Thank you to everyone who who is really helping us um, kind of kick this show off. Just real quick, related to that, if you like this show, you know, we are in the early stages of this show, so spread the word. Give us a review on Apple Podcasts or wherever you can review your podcast. It really does help a lot, especially in the beginning as we're kind of building the momentum. And uh, and also you can support us directly if you want to. Instead of just subscribing to the feed, go to patreon.com slash AI Inside Show. We have some extra perks for people who want to contribute directly to us and the production of the show. And we've got some really great ideas for that. So check that out. That's the housekeeping. We got it out of the way. It didn't take very long. Why don't we get to our amazing guest this week? Sven Sturmer Thaulo is the EVP uh, and Chief of uh, Data and Technology um, Officer at Shipstead. And uh, Sven is here with us to talk all about kind of creating an LLM for media in Norway. Sven, it's really nice to meet you. Nice to have you on the show today. Thank you. Really great to be here. Looking forward to this hour. Yeah, yeah, we've got some really great stuff to talk about. I mean, last week we had Rick uh, Scrinta on from the Common, um, why am I suddenly Common Crawl thinking? Foundation. Com That's right, Common Crawl Foundation. And we talked, you know, it, it kind of tied into Jeff's visit. Jeff goes to DC um, a couple of weeks ago, and you were kind of part of part of that soupy mix as well. And Jeff, I gotta say, you you made a, a very strong case for Sven because Sven and his team are doing some really cool work uh, with Shipstead. Tell tell us a little bit about your Jeff, your interest in kind of this story. You know, let me give you a little media background here. Yeah. Shipstead is, and I I do not exaggerate, the most admired news company and uh, cause of the most jealousy in the news industry in the world because they've been successful and they've figured out the internet better than any other company I know of online. And uh, they've done that uh, in various ways. They have successful subscriptions in Norway, very high penetration, a very high subscription rate versus other countries. Um, they have very good news products. They've built other news companies. So I watch Shipstead regularly. A lot of news people do, and they wanted to go visit Shipstead all the time. Finally, Shipstead, enough with you, all you visiting fire people. That's it. When I was in San Francisco for the World Economic Forum uh, AI Governance Summit, I was standing there at a cocktail party where I knew no one talking to a very nice Norwegian executive and we're talking about LLMs and he said, Oh, you know, so we're uh, Norway being Norway. All of our stuff is digitized and we're building an LLM in the Norwegian language and Shipstead is leading the way to get other publishers to join in. I said, aren't, aren't they all complaining like they are in America? And they said, no. So I looked it up and I saw Sven's address to the uh, 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 Nordic media conference doing just that encouraging publishers to join in and lease the research phase on building a Norwegian language LLM. And it shows such a different attitude to what we see in the US where publishers are trying to clamp down and expand um, copyright and shrink fair use. And they're getting all hostile with, with each other. And it's just different in Norway. So I, I, I wrote a post about this and I ended it with saying, why can't we just be like Norway? <laughs> and when Jason saw, Jason, when you saw that, you said, can we get Sven on? Yeah. So Sven is here, thank goodness. And we can, we can talk about the LLM and Shipstead's AI strategy and more. Uh, if I got Great. that right or wrong, uh, Sven, by all means say so. No, I think it was pretty pretty accurate. Absolutely, let's, uh, let's dig into it. Yeah, let's dig into it. So for, uh, first of all, I guess, your when when did you join the company this was what five years ago and and when you joined was this a glimmer in your eye at that stage or kind of how did how did this all kind of take place and if we look at the kind of the the uh, the timeline of the last five years um five or so years since you've uh been there like how did this all progress how did it begin so i mean chipstead has been working with ai in its um, more larger sense for about 10 years right so okay. um but that's not been on the gen ai 
naturally. But since we live up the written word, I mean, language models and the related technologies of that has always been a focus for us. Um, I think about, I joined about the 219 and very soon in around 2021, we started on a strategy project that we call Horizon, which was for the Future Institute with Amy Webb and that team, uh, trying to look a bit further into the horizons of the major trends and using their proprietary way of doing foresight work, uh, which was very helpful for us actually. And we looked into not only technologies, but you know, more on generic level of trends that can be macroeconomic trends, politics, it can be technology and so on and so on. And one of the, all of the technology trends that would not like pointing directly to AI, which we've been working with for a long time, particularly in the more the recommendation system space, right? Um, pointed to consumer uh, attitude and things that we thought were important for our company where the underlying enabling technology was AI. So we decided to double down and create, you know, our own central team that was into AI and future technologies, which we didn't really have at that time. We actually had shut it down because we didn't really succeed. It was, you know, hard to get these experts to really interlock with our business. But now we restarted it. Um, and that was 2021, 2022. And then we started to fumble around, you know, with with language models and we went into research collaborations and so on with universities, which traditionally ships it as a media company, even though Jeff says, you know, you really are in the forefront among the media companies. We've really never really had a relationship with universities. And we went specifically then very, very targeted into AI research centers that were funded by the Norwegian state. So that was kind of the beginning of it, I guess, uh, when we started. And then where, um, so, 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 the reason I called you was because of the the effort to build the Norwegian uh, and Northern Germanic language uh, LLMs. Uh, mm. If you could if you could explain as you did to me before uh, that process of the research to the phase to the commercial phase and how what you said to a fellow publishers and how they've reacted. Yes, yeah, so, so um, we went. There's there were two research labs and one of them were in Trondheim where our, our largest technical university where the head of the research uh, lab is called Jonat Legula is a, a professor in computer science and AI but also, he's always into linguistics which is quite normal within the generative AI space and I asked him when we started you know it was like an eight year run to start an AI, a, a lab like that and I asked him because I was the chair of the, the, the new the new this new lab and I asked him as the head of the lab I said you know what what kind of dent in the small head can we do in this large universe within that time and he said well we need to make a Norwegian language model and I said well at least let's do that I mean we do a lot of other things because Norway is really into energy and windmills and you know petroleum and stuff like that as well in that AI AI lab but so we really in, went into getting that done and of course, that was before OpenAI and ChatGPT and so on. And after a while, we understood, you know, that, you know, the data is really key for us and the language data is really key. And you start really figuring out how do we get hold of that data and how do we get the rights to use that data? And then one of the key players in a small country like we are, it's a small language, no, it's not English, is to get hold of the, the Norwegian data that has high quality. Um, mm -hmm. And one of the sources are the media companies. So uh, what we wanted to do was then first to get the media companies to, to give us the rights to use the data for research purposes, to actually prove that our hypothesis was that, you know, that these models can perform better in our native language than the big frontier models. Um, and uh, that's what we did. And that's what you watched there, Jeff, in, in Bergen. I think that was last year. Uh, when we try to really argue towards the other media companies, you know, that uh, this is important for our culture. Uh, it's important for, because language is an important part of any culture and particularly in small countries, it's super important. Um, secondly, it's super important to align these models according to our values. And our values are different than other countries' values, at least the region and the Nordics. You know, Jeff, you mentioned before we, we started this thing that you knew the editor of Often Posten back in the days, and he was the guy that actually really confronted Facebook when they deleted the beat, the, the image of the napalm girl. Exactly. Do you recall that? Yes, uh, 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 put it up. Um, it would have been taken down from an artist, and then he put it up too, kind of daring Facebook, and Facebook took it down, and he 
couldn't get anybody at Facebook to say this is journalism. This is not mm. pornography. Mm. Yeah, he right. He was also a leader in the world in in trying to change the relationship of news and Facebook. So in that in that respect, you can see the language model says the same thing, right? That is like who decides what kind of values the language model has. And, and when you think about language models as infrastructure for, for example, educational tooling in textbooks, how important isn't, isn't it really to align those models according to the values of the country? Uh, so that was another argument. And the, and the third one, which is a bit more, I mean, on the long-term side, we don't really know, but how important infrastructure are the LLMs going to be for countries? So let's say that a country uses an LLM from something that is not an, an ally and it's instrumental into all services in society, even in, this, in the services of the state. Is it okay that all these things are run just you know, like cloud somewhere? Or are there particular use cases where you would like to have some more control over that infrastructure? And I'm not talking about the frontier, massive frontier models. I'm talking about more foundational models are used for your own language and for, for certain purposes. And then, uh, of course, in general strokes, I think we all also said that, you know, this is a part of our responsibility as comp media companies in a small country like ours. I mean, we, we live of the written word. We generate a lot of, uh, of content. And it's really amongst our responsibilities to make sure that, you know, the, the language that we have thrives in a new digital space, which the generative AI space actually is. Mm -hmm. It's a big of a long story, but that's uh, at least how we approached so, it that time. So I've got ton tons of questions, but mm. um, yeah. uh, uh, you also explained to me when we talked before my testimony that uh, you're in the process of making a deal for the purposes of research. Mm. That's going to be separate from a commercial use and probably then revisiting the publishers and revisiting the business model at that time. One of the discussions that we're having in the U.S. is about the use of um, content for the purposes of training a model versus for the purposes of output. Mm. And a lot of us see training as fair use because it is transformative, because it, it, it it's just it's just the right to read and learn and be taught. And no, I don't think the machine is anthropomorphic. I'm just using that in a general way. The company that runs the machine has a right or the institution that runs the machine. Mm. And so, so that's what that's different from the machine being asked to quote something and quoting it if it does not have the proper rights. So do you see that separation between training and output? There's various words that are being used around that. Um, and is the in the interpretation of your fellow publishers is the use of their content for this research in essence use for training and the commercial end the output end will come later the the the, the, the two step model we have been thinking about is that first we 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 release the content which we think is really our property right um for trying to build this LLM and see how it performs in our language for research purposes. If we then prove that this copyrighted content is important for making good quality LLMs in Norwegian or in the Nordics for that sake, then we need to figure out the commercial terms. So I think that that's kind of a two-step model instead of just going straight to the really difficult part, which is the commercial part. But then I'd like to make a couple of notes on that. So first of all, we, we believe, of course, that the content that we create is our property and it shouldn't be taken by anyone without asking us. However, we don't really think, I'm not really concerned about being paid for that historic data in large amounts. We don't think that's a business model in itself. What we are more concerned about is really having access to the results of the training at fair, fair terms, and particularly when we are contributing to data. So let's say what what we would be angry about is like let's say we were scraped all our content was taken probably quite a bit of it is it's taken by the big frontier models they come back to us and they ask us to pay shitloads of dollars <laughs> to use that <laughs> language model that is just not fair right so there needs to be some kind of a trade where we contribute to something and we get something back uh, and then we are also really into open source right i mean we're small comp tech companies like we are in, in the in the larger sense of the world, we we would like a very very thriving open source community. So we are more leaning towards you know open sourcing things to get things back to us 
instead of buying this on a proprietary basis. Then I would say that, you know, after we talk, Jeff, there's a lot happening in the Norwegian government, which is quite interesting. So the Ministry of Culture gave a task to the National Library, which has digitized about 90% of all Norwegian content. That's quite impressive, right? Just very impressive. Yeah, very, so, that's, very so the, it's yeah, it's, it's, so it's like the whole corpus of everything, right? Um, and they will then, together with the research institution that I'm the chair of, and together with the University of Oslo, we will now train models with all also of the publishers, so the books of Norway that are copyrighted, to really see if those models perform way better when we add long text to the LLMs. And if that is the case, then we need to discuss with the state the publishers, the media companies, you know, whether which those rights should be bought out, for example. So that's kind of the, the sentiment in the Norwegian society and, and our, I would say our government is, is quite forward leaning in this now. Hmm. The question that comes to mind for me is about, you know, convincing fellow publishers into this, like the challenge is there, like I, you know, obviously, I have a very US centric view and what we're dealing with right now are publications like the New York Times, you know, flipping a lid over over this and saying, no, absolutely, this is this is not okay. And cutting off the siphon because they want to protect their work and it is their work. So I can understand, you know, their their desire to do that. But um, how how do you go about convincing publishers uh, into this? You know, did, did you run into any interference or any kind of hesitation around this the way I feel like we've seen in so many other examples has happened? Well, the, there is hesitation about commercial models. I don't think every anyone has really figured out, you know, how's the compensation to the yeah. to the right writers of the content, right? And and um, so, so that's still kind of a bit unsolved. But I think that the mentality is that you know, none of our companies, the media companies and the Nordics are large enough, and we're the largest one, uh, to do this by ourselves. Hmm. Um, so we need to do it together. And secondly, we can just benefit from doing it together because we need these foundational models to, to make better products for our users or, or have better productivity in our companies. So, so unless we get these models, these trained models, and we can then specifically train them with our I would say very important, you know, data that we don't share with anyone um, for specific purposes in our companies, then we are going to, you know, fall behind in this development. And this, I, I think that this is a, one of the, those big moments in the media industry going forward that unless we really endorse this and try to think about how we get our jobs done towards our customers in a way, in a different way with this technology, then we are going. This is might be the last battle of the media industry towards the big uh, big tech giants. So, what would your advice be to American media companies, given what you've watched happening here, so different from what's happening in, under your leadership in Norway? I think they should think about collaboration, uh, making language models, foundational language models that are not the frontier models, right? But language models in English that they probably can do together, which can be a basis for their product development without having paying paying a lot to, to other companies. I think they shouldn't be too um, optimistic about how much that content is worth. I mean, New York Times is a special case, right? For, for making language models. I mean, what is the willingness to pay for, for a delta in a corpus that's just enormous? It's uh, It must have extreme high value. And then being willing to, to go into reasonable trades if you want to do that with commercial players in addition. Yeah, you told me that that you've experimented already with putting. A, you told me that that the model is that you've built is performing better than so. So so far, you're proving the hypothesis. Tell me more about that. But also that at Shipstead, you did an experiment of doing what I want to see American publishers do, which is to find new uses for generative AI. And one that you talked about was putting um, your LLM in front of Shipstead content so that readers could enter into a different user interface and relationship with that content. Can you tell us love about that. that? Yeah, I love that. Yeah, now I can tell you a little bit about what we're doing, right? So we're, we're also training our own model that's not actually based on the one that 
it's not based now on the one that we're building in, in Trondheim, but it's based on one of the national library's early models where we then are, are pre-training that continuing to pre-train it. And we tested it for what well, a simple use case a lot of media companies do, right? So I want to generate a title out of this article that the journalists wrote so the desk can get different proposals on articles. And we tested it, you know, with the OpenAI version and a couple of other models and this specific model. And the specific model that we, we talked about right here just outperformed by far all the other models. So it was a very it's a smaller foundational model, uh, but that is specific on Norwegian language that is performing way better. So now we have, you know, articles that where where the title is generated by an AI. There's a human that is actually approving it, right? But but still, the desk gets you know four different proposals in their content management tool. You say well, these are the four proposals we have, and they just click on this one and they push it out there. So that's that's uh, one of the cases that we've done. Um, then the second question you asked me was about that agent, wasn't it, Jeff? Um, regarding you know tech reviews and stuff like that. Yes, exactly. Mm -hmm. yep. Yeah. So so I think what we really want to do is to to really experiment with how can users and we have a very strong destination company both in our marketplaces business and a media business so people come to our sites they don't go through facebook or google to find our news or find our items on a classified site but we would like to you know experiment with how can how can users in this conversational interface interact with us in a different way so what we did was to say okay let's just try it out just make an ad agent on top of like you know a tech crunch kind of newspaper with lots of reviews on different consumer electronics and stuff like that. And just make a, a bot where you can say, you know, hey, um, I got this small uh, living room. Um, it's like four meters from the from the sofa to the TV. It's a bit bright. I don't have more than $1,200, but I'd like to buy a TV. So could you recommend me one? And then it kind of pops back, you know, with, yeah, based on our tests and what you wrote right now, we would recommend you to buy this in this TV. It, you know, it, it we just shipped it out there, um, and it they it was it was uh, it was hacked by some of our own people, you know, within a couple of hours, and they just tested it back and forth and ran it for two three hours, and then they took it down, and then they learned shit loads, and they're probably going to launch stuff again. So that's just the way we try to operate, just to try to experiment and figure out how can we do this in the best possible way. Yeah, it seems it, to me. Yeah, no, I was just going to say it seems to me that the. Um... As I'm hearing you talk about kind of the benefits for a publication uh, or media company of creating an LLM around their own content, I could see, like, like take New York Times, like I could see New York Times being uh, open to something like that, but you know, in a very controlled environment, in a very controlled situation, taking all their content and saying, "This is our value add. This is how we." allow people who are fans of our content who you know are dedicated to the new york times um to lean into their trust of what we've created and feel like we have some sort of control and can add value with that in in new and different directions but i guess that goes counter to this idea of all the different publications kind of working together with one giant pile of of you know collaborative data but isn't that which... kind of the input and output jason where where the 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 training of the model everyone shares in the benefit but yeah, if you want to be. serve to re your readers your content then you have the rights to do that as a separate operation is, yeah. is that kind of where you're headed uh, yeah yeah I but yeah but i think i think i think i mean i mean is it all content or is it some content right so i mean for a yeah. news company there are there's just lots of content that just breaking news just has a value for hours right and then it's off it doesn't yes. have any more value True. So, so you can take historical, uh, typical historical data that doesn't really have a value, and get really good output of make using that data for making a foundational model, which is the basis for what you build those specialized LLMs for your purpose, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But I mean, at, let's take I, I'm not New York Times, but I mean they have lots of food recipes, right? Mm -hmm. That's data that actually is value for a very long time. So it's Absolutely. not given that they want to give that away, right? That that, that that's fair. I mean, mm -hmm. so but but if they they be a bit more nuanced, I think that probably you know they would take base models like we do now with Mistral is a French company that's building you know a base model that they open sourced, and then we train on top of that 
to get that model to become better with Norwegian language, particularly also from Shipstead. So that's the approach that probably New York Times should look into because they need those kind of language models, that's for sure. They can't base themselves on open AI or any of those. It's just too too costly. I'd love to, to, to brainstorm a few possible uses that journalism should be making. You've already gone through a couple. Oh, I have tons. I have tons. I to let, me, let, me <laughs> mention, let me mention two and hear what you think of those, and then I'd love to hear, hear yours. One is uh, whether the news industry should, besides building an LLM, build an API to their news so that models that are out of date as they are, um, when they need to call on current content, you have a key, you have a business deal, and and and, and you, you, you make it more of a service to the AI industry rather than being hostile to that industry. Let's create a service for them. That's one. Uh, and, and, and Amy Reinhardt, uh, who is at the Associated Press, is working on building that API for the industry. Uh, she's doing that in the executive program I, I taught in. But I also think there's other interfaces between AI companies and, and news. Uh, I'll, I'll throw that mm. one out first. What do you think of that? I think it's quite an interesting idea, idea because it's kind of an open and innovation idea where you say, okay, um, let's be honest, folks. Uh, since the internet came, what we did was to connect you know, the, the paper newspaper to electricity. That's more or less what we've done, right? It's just the art, the artifact, the article is still there. There's, there's like barely companies that have done, you know, recommendation systems that are, you know, ten percent of what they can do in Netflix. I mean, that's the kind of the innovation done. Let's be a bit, bit, bit blunt about this. So, so to, to to kind of challenge ourselves and say, okay, we can't do all this innovation ourselves. Let's do an open innovation mode. I, I, I like that idea. I think it's uh, quite interesting. But you have to have some kind of a payment thing, right? Yes. And it need and it needs to be some. You need to be a bit, you know, careful in the way that you don't want to be pressured down in the value chain uh, too much, right? Because that's that's kind of the that's the really 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 holy grail of the news business is to have the end user there. But yes. might not get innovation if you're just stuck with that all the time. So the other idea that that I've had um, is 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 for the newsroom use. I talked to an editor of a of a not for profit newsroom in a large state in the U.S. and said, imagine if you had your readers go out and record a um, hundred school board meetings, and you come back and the machine can now very easily uh, transcribe that, and then you could query that data. You could say how many school boards are looking at what's going on in America right now at banning books um, or mm. worrying about about. The, restrooms or i saw today that one one school took all the mirrors out of the school because kids were using the mirrors to make tiktoks you know so what are they <laughs> talking about at the school boards um uh you you could do something that no single journalist or no single newsroom could have done before but now could do in collaboration with the public as gatherers of data um what does yeah. that sound like I think it's super interesting. It's like it's citizen journalism in a way. I think we've tried it out some in different companies in Norway before. I think the big, you know, really big game changer is the ability to crunch all of that data to find those anomalies, right? That's the, the investigative uh, journalism. I mean, the, the really, the really, the really, really good journalism where people are using, you know, whole, our journalists are using a whole year to gather data from different municipalities or from courts mm -hmm. or whatever it is to figure out what's going on. Then they then they get that data and then they have to spend loads of time and data scientists to figure out those anomalies to say, you know, in this municipality and this municipality, they're doing this, this and that. And that's the story. And now you probably can just parse those documents or spreadsheets or videos or whatever it is to try to find those things with those tools. So I'm really looking forward to seeing, uh, you know, that one of the jobs to be done that we have is to, you know, to keep the keep the ones with power accountable for what they do. Yes, that's going to be way harder with these tools in the in the in the hands of the journalists. So I think you know those people abusing their power, be aware. And we just, you know, we we had a minister that had to leave her office last week and the reason for that was that one guy figured out that and she was you know the minister of education by the way that he said that, you know that then taking a student to court to the to supreme court for for um for copying some stuff in their master's degree right so you know be super strict with the student and you know they lost and they took her to the supreme court and this guy said well let me look at the master's degree of these ministers. <laughs> so he took the master's thing and he put it into this uh, AI tool, which they use mm -hmm. in schools, right? To find out whether they copied stuff. And she was busted. She left one hour afterwards. It's one on Twitter. 
this is fake. She copied stuff. The master is a uh, what you call plagiary, right? Right. And she's out. So, what are some of the other uses that you dream of for using this at Shipstead? The, the general technology of AI. You know, I'm not going to use the all the time for just talk about all the usual things we do. You know, that's you know uh, transcript based transcription and stuff. But what I think we really need to do is to to think about you know how can we move away from just putting electricity on an article. So I'm not talking about recommendations and that stuff, right? But how can we really serve people in the job to be done that we are there to to solve for them in a different way with AI? So let's just take one idea that we're refunding, which is that are we just talking about that? You know, are we going to make this? I would say you know inf infinite article. Uh, just a live thing that goes around the story, almost like it is in TV, right? That's continuously just describing the domain. It's not like this is an updated article. You know, this that's the way we do it right now. And and you can zoom out of the article in a, from a domain perspective and just look at this in a bigger view. You can zoom in and you can understand more in details on one of the sections. Practically, you can just you can just see that this becomes like a, a cognitive map of a whole, of a whole domain. Right? Can you do that? I mean, that's that's fully possible to do, but you need to really use these tools to be able to do it. And by that, you can practically reach the you know the holy grail of of uh, getting the job to be done. That I mean, you Jeff and you Jason, you have different opinions on what is good for you, right? Mm -hmm. We know that since internet came along, but has the news industry done anything about it? No, we don't have enough journalists, so we can't produce the content. And we're crap at using technology for recommendations, and we're also a bit careful because we don't want to make echo chambers, right? So it's a so in this space, I think that's really where we need to skate. That's where the puck is going, and, and we just need to endorse this and and try it out. I love that. Yeah, Isn't... I love that too. What does that look like in in like I like I'm in practical terms when I'm thinking about you know, and and maybe this is I guess the the big challenge is okay. We know that we that this would be an amazing use of this information to broaden out what we know about journalism and how we you know stay up to date on a you know a, a topic or a current news item that's you know kind of building you know the, the previous paradigm was to tack on new information as we have it now this is like a living breathing document but like what is the interface or the kind of approach through which a user might you know, might interact with that. Are they chatting with the LLM about this particular thing? Or is that LLM creating that living kind of environment around that story? I'm just kind of curious if you have ideas around that. I think the LLM can and the generative AI can synthesize, you know, truly produce content by journalism in this kind of a live stream and a live media of something, right? I think mm -hmm. that that can be fully possible to do. Um, I think in my mind, it's almost like I use mind maps, right? I love mind maps. You guys use mind maps, mm -hmm. yeah, yes, right. So you Absolutely. and you can you can you can view them in like a three D way, right? You have yeah. this kind of two D thing, as you can click into something, and then woof, you go into some a deeper deeper understanding of it. If whether that's you know conveyed in text or in images or video or audio, for that sake, I I think I've just developed. I mean, that's multimedia in a way. Um, mm -hmm. But I, I don't I don't have this view of you know that's how the interface is going to look. I'm not the UXer, so I guess yeah, yeah. No, I'm just curious. Yeah, I, I, I like that. that that a lot, Sven. In terms of looking, I, I was part of a startup years ago called Daylife. May it rest in peace. It's gone. But we we speculated about about uh, how to present news in different ways, and one was to get our heads around the article versus the story, and the story is something that goes on and on and on and on and on, and an article mm. is just snapshot in there, right? Which we, our production me mechanisms made us do. But if you stand back and say, this is, this is the larger story of book banning and censorship in schools, then um, you have the opportunity, you're right, I think, to present this in a mind map way, but you also have the opportunity to take large amounts of data and let people, let the machine um, summarize it, find mm. themes in it, uh, allow the user to query it, so a reporter might come back in the future and not just write a story, but put in all the transcripts of all the interviews and all of the documents and even let the public query this to, with their questions and what they want to know from it. If you still write a story, it might come later in the process. 
I, th I think it's a perfect way of doing it. It's just this, this kind of the agent model, right? I mean, you could have an right. article, yes. <laughs> and then you can say, this is a part of a story, and you want to talk to the story. Yes, exactly. Simple as that, right? Or, or do you want to talk to the archives of Shipstead about this about this topic? Absolutely. Uh, you want to ask what happened 20 years ago and where patterns are. You have the opportunity to get across this in a way that goes far beyond search. Mm. Let me ask another question. Um, you, as you said earlier that if we don't get our act together, this could be the last battle. So for a moment, be dystopian and pessimistic. And mm. if we don't do what we're supposed to do in the news industry, or if we don't follow your good leadership, Stead, uh, what happens? Well, I think we are going to be disintermediated. I think people in general are lazy in terms of what level of friction they're willing to go through to get the information, right? And we started off as uh, paper newspapers and trying to catch different kind of stories and synthesizes and tailorize it to the masses. Then we tried to do it a bit more individual. It's still on the internet and the way we've done it on electricity on paper. And now it's going to be even easier for people to to access this. And I, I personally, I'm a big fan of audio interfaces. I think it's going to be extremely powerful. I think uh, mm -hmm. we're a bit disappointed, you know, based on Siri and its likes. But if you start to combine the Gen AI tools that we have out there now with audio, it's going to be super powerful. You're going to talk to computers in natural language. You're going to have a conversation mm -hmm. about things. And I think we just have to be, you know, throw away this. Oh, it's hallucinating. It's not working like this. Blah, blah. It's going to work. But so if we're not going for not as companies being able to be part of that experience that the users exp uh, are expecting, lowering the friction in access to information that's relevant for you, then we are going to be in trouble. Um, I don't know how it's going to play out, but I think the the, the the most important part is that you know a lot of the adver a lot of the newspapers of the world on the internet are still very 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 advertising based. Oh yeah, right. For sure. And and we have a quite healthy subscription business, but it's tough even in, in the Nordics where you know the reading the willingness to pay for newspapers quite is probably record high in the world. Yes. Uh, and and if you lose eyeballs and they start you know accessing this data this information in other places in a different way it doesn't take a long time before margin goes from 10 to 12 percent at best and then goes to minus 10 and then it's trouble i, I like what you the, the, the picture you're painting is also of, of using ai as a relevance machine for people to make this mass that we created for the masses uh, uh more more relevant um Jason, I've got another absolutely unrelated question. So, uh, <laughs> anything else on on topic you want to ask? Um, well, I mean, I guess, I guess the you know along kind of what you're talking about, kind of setting this dystopian view, uh, you know, of, of way things could possibly go if, if it doesn't happen. What what could you identify as the probably the biggest challenge we face then when it comes to avoiding that dystopian view? I think it is uh, the lack of willingness to invest and take risk. Ah, yeah, risk, big time. I think I think yeah. I think you know that the media industry has shown to be a um, slow-moving industry in the transition from the <laughs> early two thousands. <2000s. laughs> sure. um, it has well, it has a couple of lighthouses around the world that are trying to do things differently, but they are quite conservative, um, and they are also. Uh, protective and in some countries like in the US very threatened right they they probably feel this even more than we do in some of the Nordic countries um, so I think if they are approaching this in the way which we've met from some of our peers in the Europe as well it's like this is bad it's going to kill us um, we don't want them to take our content. We don't really want to be a part of this in a way. If you like, you stick your hand into this, your head into the sand in a way, um, then it's just that's that's the worst enemy. That's the worst enemy. So let me ask a related question there. So I lied. I probably have two questions. Um, I always do. Uh, I'm working on a new program that I hope to get started, uh, a new degree program in the university on, on what I call for now internet studies or internet humanities or bringing other disciplines into um, education for tomorrow's leaders of the internet and society on it. And so I wonder, um, looking at Shipstead, besides hiring your te technologists, besides hiring people who are going to do coding, if we even need coders in the future, one could argue, um, 
in the general larger skills in a company like Shipstead, in the newsroom, but also in sales and management and 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 marketing and so on. What kinds uh, are there different skills that you think we should be looking training students for, and that you should be looking for in the near future because of AI and the internet? But they just need to understand how to use the tools. I think that's mm -hmm. the most important. I mean, the, the statement is not mine. I mean, you're not replaced by AI, but by somebody using AI. Um, and it's um, what we do is just to be very mindful of this. It's not only about journalists or tech people or something. So we, you know, we're training. Uh, we now trained. I think three days ago we had the n employee number one thousand out of our six thousand people that have gone through very thorough courses in how to use AI. Prompt wow. if you're a, hmm. if you're a developer or you're a journalist or if you're in sales or whatever you are, people go to different kind of tracks. Um, so I think that's really the essence is to really, I, I, my daughter is com studying computer science up in NTNU. I said, you know, the only thing you need to do is to use whatever AI tool you find. Just yeah. use it because that's mm -hmm. just, it's like being in the internet when, you know, <laughs> when World Wide Web came along. It's just yeah. like, it's, it's the same thing happening and you just need to test out everything and learn how to use those tools. So I think that's the most important, Jeff. It's just not, you don't, you don't need to train them, but you need to be very open about, you know, these tools are here to stay. It's like, it's, it's like you, if you're using a manual typewriter and then there comes a computer along, it says, I don't want to use a computer. Yeah. Yeah. So I note a guitar behind you. Jason is a musician. <laughs> so I'm, I'm curious what you see happening with AI in other areas besides journalism. And let's just say in media and entertainment. Mm -hmm. um, are you seeing development in uh, the Nordics as well there in interesting ways? Well, there are, I mean, in, in the Nordics, so they're, they're very different kind of societies in many ways. I would think, you know, in Norway, it's, you know, it's a lot about B2B business and industries. Uh, and I think particularly in like heavy industries, it's, there's, they haven't moved a lot. They're working a lot more with predictive and uh, predictive analytics and AI in that way. Um, but on Gen AI, I haven't seen that much in the entertainment space. I guess the musicians are, you know, they're probably going to use it quite a bit. Uh, whether they are going to be threatened, I'm I'm not convinced yet, to be honest, even though, you know, I have shitloads of examples of good songs being made by these different services. And I made a couple of myself, let's say, which are quite, quite <laughs> impressive, but you, but you can't ship them and make money on them, can you? No. No, doesn't seem that uh, way. It, it's really interesting and, and very timely because last weekend I was in uh, Anaheim and, uh, you know, down in Southern California for a music marketing convention called NAM. Uh, probably one of the biggest ones. And I went there wondering if I was going to see a lot about artificial intelligence, just based on the moment we're at and hearing about all the, you know, the, the, the you know, people getting up in arms about copyright around music, you know, uh, cloning and that, that sort of stuff with, with artificial intelligence. And mm. I didn't see much while I was there, but what I did pick up is that it really, it was almost like AI was, it was a terminology that was used in whispered terms, almost like, well, used AI. It was almost like it was a bad word. And no okay. one wanted to admit if they were using it, they really didn't want to admit it, you know, because they didn't want any, any, you know, sort of um, analysis around what that actually means. So well, I'm looking forward to South by Southwest this year and looking at uh, oh, yeah. trying to see what's catching up there. It's going to be probably Gen AI all over. I think you're right. Absolutely. I think that's probably the better, the better place to go for that, that sort of like combination of technology and music where I went felt very kind of like, uh, it felt very much like the the traditional thought of making music. There was a lot of technology, but anyways, didn't see nearly as much around AI as I had hoped. Um, we do have some news items to get to, but I don't want to end the interview until I know that we're actually at the end of it. Jeff, do you have any any kind of final final things burning? No, burning I just think uh, what are uh, there's other time. I would love to hear more about the training, but we don't have time for that. And, yeah, and I mean, we could we friends. could talk about the training and, and uh, well, just no, let me just ask the quick question. Yeah. Um, for uh, yeah, what's what's the essence of the of, of the training that you're putting people through, journalists or not? Well, the for the for the tech people, it's really about how do they, of course, use AI and build AI tooling, right? That's that's mm -hmm. uh, that's the key thing. Product people, it's like what problems can you solve with AI, and which ones should you not try to solve with AI? Because sometimes you try to you know to to just solve it with AI just for the heck of it, and uh, that's not what we want to happen. Um, 
then we have more a general one that really explains what it is and what tools we have. And now we're making um, a prompting course. So we're going to <laughs> drive. We're going to drive that through all our employees, uh, and then we're going to make it more specific for certain disciplines. We haven't really chosen which ones they are, you know. But most likely, sales should have one. Uh, journalists should have another one, and so on and so on. So more like a generic, you know, how do you use these tools, and then go branch out in. Sorry for that. Branch out in different, uh, in in different, I would say, disciplines in a way. I I'm just, I'm just real quick. I'm just taken by how empowered I feel in hearing you talk about your, you and your company's approach to this. It's a very empowering position as opposed to, I think a lot of people come to this from that point of fear, from that point of, oh, no retraction, pull, you know, hold things close so that things don't change. And really this entire interview has been an example of what what you can get if you open up to this in this inevitable reality, which is that AI is here and they are tools to be used. And if you open yourself up to them, you can create some really amazing things. I'm just really inspired by by that and by your approach. It's good to hear. Good to hear. That's what ships that has been done, doing for 183 years, empowering people go. in their daily lives. You know, <laughs> and just endorsing endorsing the new technologies from yes. from the printing press practically. So well, that's Fantastic. what we do. Well, I'm going to make this uh, conversation required listening for uh, various of my people in the business. But thank you so much for doing this. I'm grateful. Should we do some news, Jason? Yeah. And uh, Sven did say he'd stick around a little bit because we just have, have a couple of news items. We have probably like maybe 10 more minutes in the in the show before we have to end. But um, so, you know, just a couple of news items that kind of caught our attention this week. And mine... I'm I continue to be uh, fascinated by, you know, things like the video generation, um, kind of the creative, the creativity, uh, you know, morphing and crossing um, that Venn diagram with with artificial intelligence. And Google had an announcement about Lumiere, their AI video uh, generator, which basically does things a little bit different from my understanding from other video generators. If you've ever used a video generation AI, you often will see that frame to frame certain things aren't constant. Like the, the frames change and they evolve, but certain realities about what you're seeing, if you take the first frame and then you go to the last frame, you know, what used to be a, you know, a forehead may have evolved into like a wispy hairdo or something, something along those lines. And Lumiere essentially is doing this differently. Um, it's, uh, what is it called? Motion and location in tandem so there's space and time it analyzes where things should be placed also how they should move and it does that through a single run through process and that allows for this kind of smoother motion output and um things stay constant for the most part so you know it also does in painting so you can do the silly things like hey change that shirt from a t-shirt to you know a button up or whatever the case may be but there are other competitors out there runway pika labs which i've had some um some interaction with and is doing really cool things and and everything this isn't a product that you can use right now it's a research product but um you know so either we're going to get the ability to use it somewhere down the line or google's going to do what they often do which is integrate it into some other part of their google verse before but um kill it. before yeah before they get bored of it and decide to kill it that's true i found this <laughs> interesting jason uh gary marcus who writes a lot about ai put up a post today about um the mistakes that ai makes because it knows the close relationship of one pixel to the next or one word to the next mm -hmm. but the larger picture playing out has problems with it he put up a, 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 a ai generated photo of a man hugging a unicorn and the, the unicorn's horn goes right through his head uh apparently with no harm and no blood and 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 it just shows that it doesn't understand that larger context yet which is just kind of kind of fascinating oh man Sven, <laughs> you see a, it's a little freaky i mean um, it's got its own it, it's almost made you know i don't know what the point would be but it, it looks like it's making some sort of a point in and of itself it's kind of beautiful to look at even though it's totally wrong <laughs> right so if, if google oh, can find coherence within a video that's fascinating sven do you see much yeah. use for video at shipstead not at this point in time no, yeah. not at this point in time no yeah. So another story that I found interesting, I'm eager to hear Sven's view on this one, is uh, you probably all saw that that uh, uh, the videos were put up, unfortunately, of Taylor Swift 
uh, who's the subject of every kind of bad social thing, uh, in addition yeah. to the adoration. And um, uh, on on Twitter, they didn't know what to do, so they just stopped all searches for Taylor Swift, which is kind of a blunt way to deal with uh, moderation. And um, uh, Microsoft is making changes to its tool so that it can't be used to do this. And And I've been arguing for some time that I think that people who believe that we can build guardrails on foundation models to prevent it from doing bad things, that's as, as foolish as saying that you can, Gutenberg could have made the press so that it couldn't print certain things. It's up to the humans who use it who can get around any rule and will use it however they choose and will find bad ways to use it, especially if we put up guardrails saying, oh, we gotcha, you can't do anything bad here and people are going to do it. Kevin Roos convinced ChatGPT to fall in love with him uh, and to give it dark visions of life. Uh, I think we're going to see a difficult moment where people are going to realize that this is a general use tool like a printing press, like a camera, and it can it can capture and create bad things and good things. And no, we can't make the company anticipate every possible bad use someone could imagine and build protection against it. Sven, what uh, do you I think, think yeah. about, about guardrails? I, I think I think you're perfectly right. I think that uh, you will have to just to see this as any other tool. I think though that you know the the large services, the ones that are relating to to hundreds of millions of consumers, most likely have to implement guardrails um, mm -hmm. because it's just they don't just want this content to be created. But I think that to have that as a regulation is super super difficult it's it's not realistic at all um i mean to just take one example that we've done you know we were we were just flooded with all kinds of fake photos for, particularly from ukraine um so we just gathered collaborated between the different media companies and we made a a, a group of people that are fact checking all these images and videos Yep. from the different media companies rather than doing it ourselves just because it's just so damn difficult and you can't expect adobe or any of these to make systems that said okay we're going to put any watermark on everything that's generated from our tools blah 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 i don't, I don't believe it it's just going to be too much open source out there yeah i think so and well that's one of the arguments people make against open source is oh my god they can get around the guardrails then but uh, that that just makes the big old companies you wouldn't be able to use um mistral if open source were out, outlawed in Europe, as some regulators were discussing. So I think, yeah, I think that's a fool's errand. Oh. Jason, you have one more than I want. I know that Sven had a story too he mentioned before, so I want to get to that as well. Yeah, ahead, yeah. well, this one was just, uh, the this one essentially is open AI and common sense media, which as a parent of, of two you know young daughters, I've used common sense media over the years so many times to, you know, check up on like a movie and see, you know, are there moments in this movie that are that might be inappropriate to show my kids? And it was just a really nice tool and still is. Um, but open AI and common sense media have entered into a partnership um, aiding teens in avoiding, um, you know, misuse and harm in the AI tools. This is kind of part of something Common Sense Media had already been doing. They've already been reviewing AI assistance for in recent months. But this part of this agreement apparently has um, has something to do with OpenAI's GPTs and potentially Common Sense Media creating family friendly GPTs, which I think is interesting had to see it come in have no idea what that even means or you know what that what that uh, turns into but the reason that i wanted to put this in there in here is because i was in my 10 year old daughter's classroom yesterday helping the teacher do some work and um while i was there the art teacher was up at the head of the class and they were kind of going over their artwork and everything and in a 10 year old's classroom one kid shot his hand up and he said can i use ai for this problem for for this assignment <laughs> i mean at 10 years old they're th they're realizing and they're connecting the dots and everything what was the so teacher's just, answer uh no well i mean her answer was no you you can't but i don't you know and i'm i'm sure that she would be able to Might detect, anyway. you know, the work of a 10 year old versus the work of an AI. But uh, just really interesting, this moment that we're in, especially around education. I know that's a topic that I would love to get on a future episode. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. So Sven, you mentioned something that happened that I didn't even know about before we got on, on, on the air, so to speak. Yeah, yeah, there was a colleague of mine, one of our brainy guys on AI, Ian Venman, that just made the note to me that, you know, that ChatGPTs just have this 
new function where you can pull any GPT into a conversation just using the at name of the GPT, right? And uh, he had a very interesting <laughs> reflection. So how long is it before we make a mini me out of yourself with all the content that you produce and that can be pulled into any dialogue or you can have even multiple individuals that are actually GPTs that talk to each other. So where is this going and to end? It may do a good job. Um, yeah, I, I took my. I, I have a book coming out in the fall about the internet. Uh, it takes them forever. Uh, the copy edit's done. Uh, called the web we weave: Why we must reclaim the internet from moguls, misanthropes, and moral panic. And so I took the, uh, the the title's almost as long as the book. I took the entire manuscript. I put it into Google's Notebook LM, and asked to summarize it. And in seconds, it did, and it did a good job. Which might mean that mm. I wrote a simplistic book, but it was. It was pretty awe-inspiring, and I've asked LLMs, you know, the obvious egotistical questions, things about me, and they get things wrong. We know that, but in summarizing content, they're pretty amazing. And being yeah. able to grab onto the essence of a speaker and mimic them, yeah, that could be yeah. fun. Mini Jeff, Mini Jeff, the Jeff GPT. <laughs> yes. Jeff, more yeah. people want to shut me up than have me speak more. <laughs> <laughs> Jeff, yeah, Jeff GPT with a mute button. For, for those who need them. <laughs> that's, that's the premium version. You yes, gotta you got to pay extra for that one. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, well, this is this is so great. Is, oh, and you you had a last one. Did you want to did you want to mention that one, Jeff? Oh, I, was that. Just, I saw the first really useful GPT uh, application. I haven't used it, uh, but uh, it was a great idea. A GPT that summarizes your screenshots. Called Keep on, It Shot on my. My, the Mac I use for the for these shows, when I take screenshots, it's just it's just a, a hundreds of them, and I have oh, no yeah. idea what they are. I can't find them. I can't get thumbnails. And this is just a the simplest little thing that's useful. So I just wanted to. Yeah, we don't we don't want those as well. We've been we just added you know all the privacy documents we have that people have to relate <laughs> to. You know, it's super complex, and it's just called Privacy GPT, and anyone in the company can just ask it. Or we put the AI AI Act into a GPT, and you can just ask the AI Act about stuff. So all these kind of things that you never access, right? Just put them into a GPT and open it for people. That's you know that that's making me think about terms of service and stuff. And this this thing that you know everybody is presented with a million different directions on all the things they use, and most people rarely, if ever, read a single lick of it. Um, partially because it's so darn long and exhausting and everything, and you know you got to kind of comprehend all that stuff. So it's not always that easy. A uh, custom GPT might actually be a, a service that a particular organization or site could offer mm -hmm. to give you as a user a direct ability to check in on certain things there. Yeah. That could be incredibly useful. Terms, ter terms and conditions, GPT, am I being screwed? Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Right. <laughs> the GPT that looks out for you. Oh yeah, sure. Yeah. Yes. Well, Sven, this has been uh, such a an honor and a privilege to have you on for the last hour, and also at, as late as it is where you are right now. I think it's now eleven p.m. Um, so I apologize for that, but we really no appreciate problem. you uh, joining us for the last hour to talk about. Uh, I, I think this was a really you know inspiring conversation. This shows yes. what can happen if we don't turn toward the kind of fear and uncertainty and the doubt, the, the FUD that's out there around this stuff, and instead look at it it is an opportunity to you know maybe create something better for everyone that's uh that's something to be totally respected and i appreciate that you guys are doing that that awesome work thank you so much for being here yeah absolutely um and then it's shipstead.com uh anything else you want to point people to this is kind of your opportunity to direct them anywhere you want them to go <laughs> yeah you can just write me sven.taulo at uh, shipstead.com simple right. as that right on well, Sven, it's been an honor. Thank you so yes, much. Thank for, you so much, Sven. Yeah, for joining us. And Jeff, uh, what do you want to plug? As we oh, wrap nothing right up? now. Just the usual Gutenberg parenthesis. Uh, Gutenberg parenthesis .com. There are discount codes which weren't working but are working again for my books, uh, the Gutenberg parenthesis and magazine. Excellent. Gutenberg parenthesis .com. Um,
And as for me, inside.show for this show, of course, but um, yellowgoldstudios.com will take you to the, at least the YouTube channel right now that we have for this particular show and other things that I'm working on. Ultimately, I'm going to have a website up, but I'm not quite there. I'm trying to do all the things myself right now. And let me tell you, it is not easy, uh, but I'm doing my best. This show, AI Inside, normally publishes every Wednesday, and it will again uh, this week, but we recorded it a little early, so sorry to throw you off. Uh, sometimes we have to do that. We have to time shift. Um, normally, we record every Wednesday at 11 a.m. Pacific, 2 p.m. Eastern. Uh, like I said, if you go to YouTube or Twitch, you can search for Yellow Gold Studios, and you will find this show as one of the shows on the network. Subscribe by going to AIinside.show. You can support us directly by going to our Patreon at patreon.com slash AI Inside Show. And thank you so much to those who are patrons of this show supporting us directly. We've heard from so many of you, and it's just really cool to know that we have you uh, in our corner, got our back, and we really appreciate it. Um, look for us on all the major socials. Just search, search our names or AI Inside Show. Uh, we'll get you to us as well. And then if you have any feedback, you want to let us know your thoughts about any of these stories, you've got ideas for a future episode, uh, interview possibility, any of that stuff, contact at AIinside.show. Thank you so much for watching and listening, everybody. We will see you next week on another episode of AI Inside. Bye, everybody.